Well, as you heard, today is not exactly a saint's day, but it's one that's important in the history of the American Episcopal Church. I don't want to give you a history lecture, but I'll tell you just a little bit of detail because people may not necessarily know this story, although some probably do. Um, you may know that when the American colonies were formed, we didn't have any bishops. If you were someone who felt a call to be ordained and to serve anywhere on the east coast of the United States, you had to go back to England to be ordained as a priest and then come back to serve. In fact, all of the American colonies belonged for church purposes to the Bishop of London. And so when the American Revolution came, it was a, it was a confusing, I think, I think as much for the Church of England as it was for the Anglicans who remained in what became the United States. They didn't really know what to do with us because we weren't really part of them anymore. And, but that they couldn't send us a bishop to keep things going because bishops had official standing in the politics of, of Britain. Nonetheless, we realized that very quickly we were going to run out of clergy if we couldn't make more. So they got together in Connecticut in 1783 and elected a couple of priests to be bishops. Their first choice had to back out because of his health. Their second choice was Samuel Seabury, who went on to be a very regal figure. He, he's remembered for the fact that he was never exactly lacking in self-confidence ever in his life, apparently. Um, and so they made him the first bishop of Connecticut. But they didn't know what they were going to do to actually make him into a bishop once he was elected. They, they'd already talked to the people in London, and they weren't sure what they were going to do. But for some reason, he went to London anyway and talked to them, and they decided they really couldn't do it. But as luck would have it, there was a difference of opinion at that time between England and Scotland on a number of different issues, both political and religious. And so the Scots got together and said, well, if you'll do us a favor and take our side in a couple of issues, we'll make you a bishop. So he went to Aberdeen in November of 1784, a time when they have, what, like one hour of sunlight a day, and it's about 20 degrees the rest of the time. It must have been a lovely occasion. <clears throat> and three Scottish bishops ordained Samuel Seabury as a bishop. Once that was done, the English said, well, we got to get our act together here, and they ordained a couple more American priests as bishops, and the situation was taken care of. But we remember to this day that it is from Scotland that we received the first American bishop. And there are things in the way we do church now that still come down to us 220 years later, 30 years later, that remind us that that's where all this came from. So that's the history lesson. The theology lesson is why is any of this important in the first place? I mean, I would be willing to bet that a majority of, of Episcopalians kind of think of themselves as belonging to a parish, but not really to a diocese anyway. I mean, the diocese is out there somewhere, but I don't know that most Episcopalians really think about what's going on anywhere outside of their own church. And I think bishops are part of the reason why we need to have some sense of what goes on outside of our own church. Because it could be very lonely imagining that we're the only people doing this on Sunday morning. It could be very lonely to imagining that there's nobody else out there who cares about the issues that we care about who's trying to figure out how to take care of the big issues of the world that are plainly too much for us in our one little church building, in our own one little congregation. <clears throat> I think bishops are an important part of the reminder that there are other people who are doing this. There are other people who care about these things. And in fact, if we don't work with people outside of our own church, all we'll be able to do for the rest of our, our religious life is go on complaining that nothing is getting done. That's not to say that good things don't happen in parishes. They do. Next week at the convention of the diocese, two people from here will get up and talk about good things that are going on here in the hope of drawing other parishes into that work. But if there were no convention of the diocese to which everyone was required to send people, how would they ever find out? We'd be writing an awful lot of letters to other places and it wouldn't be all that effective. So... As much as some of us complain occasionally about when the bishop shows up and doesn't show up and how much money we send to the diocese and what the diocese wants from us in paperwork and all that other stuff, I think today we should give thanks for where we began all of this and the fact that, in fact, it does force us to look outside our own walls, <clears throat> to recognize that when two or three are gathered together doesn't just mean people, it means parishes too. 
and that if in fact we will recognize that the church is much bigger than just this place and just us in this one room, there is nothing that we cannot accomplish. Amen.